This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Health for the World presentation. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Neil Dossiam, who will be presenting his talk on cystic pancreatic lesions. Aniel is currently an associate professor and associate chief in the abdominal imaging division in the radiology department at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. I had the pleasure to work with him for the last 17 years. Dr. Dasim did his radiology residency in India and completed his fellowship in abdominal imaging at Malincrad Institute of Radiology in St. Louis, Missouri. Aniel has been academically prolific and has authored and contributed to nearly 60 publications and received more than 30 awards for educational exhibits for RSNA, ARS, and has presented over a dozen invited lectures. Among many of his research interests um, is uh, pancreatic diseases, including uh, biliary diseases as well. He's a member of the International Working Group for the International Consensus Guidelines for Chronic Pancreatitis and a current member of the uh, abdominal radiology disease focused panel on pancreatitis. Anil is committed to education, quality, and service, um, has encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of everything radiology um, with regard to the abdomen, has a rich collection of teaching cases, and has really taught me a lot over the years. Um, there will be a Q&A session after today's lecture, so please put your question into the Q&A box, and we will address it at the completion of the talk. Uh, I'd like to, again, uh, without further ado, please uh, introduce uh, Anil Dasiam, uh, who will be talking about cystic pancreatic lesions. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Uh, again, a very warm welcome to all the attendees uh, today. Um, this presentation is on imaging of pancreatic cystic lesions, and it's geared mainly towards radiology trainees. It's a very broad topic, and uh, I have a lot of images, so I think I'll get started right away. But before that, I want to uh, thank Health for, uh, Health for the World Academy for giving me this opportunity. I do not have any relevant disclosures for this talk. In today's presentation, I'll be talking about uh, classification of pancreatic cystic lesions, how to investigate them, talk about uh, some of the common, um, the imaging features of some of the common and uh, clinically relevant pancreatic cystic lesions, and finally, briefly touch upon the guidelines for follow-up of these cystic lesions. So what are these pancreatic cystic lesions? How common are they? And why should we care for them? Pancreatic cystic lesions are either true cystic lesions or they are lesions that have a cystic component within them. And these are fairly common. We see them fairly frequently in our day-to-day -day practice. When you look at the literature, the incidence or the prevalence quoted is very variable. Some of the older literature where MR was not used, the incidence quoted is pretty low, like less than 1%. But the most recent publications, especially those that use MR and those that involve adult population, talk about a very high prevalence, exceeding 40% according to some studies. So these are definitely very common. What is the clinical significance of these? Why should we care about these cystic lesions? Broadly, these pancreatic cystic lesions fall into three different categories. Some that are uh, malignant. So you have a component of malignancy at the time of detection of these cystic lesions. As you know, pancreatic cancer is a pretty uh, bad disease. It has a very dismal prognosis with five-year survival rate of around 11%. So when you detect a malignancy in these cystic lesions early on and offer them a curative surgery, that can be life-changing. The five-year survival is dramatically different, dramatically improved when they get an early surgery. But the surgery is a major surgery. And then you have a category of pre-malignant uh, cystic lesions. Based on some high-risk features, some of these need a surgery, a major pancreatic surgery. Some of these undergo further assessment with sampling, tissue sampling or fluid sampling. And a lot of these uh, lesions will require long-term imaging follow-up. And then we have a third category of benign lesions or a very low malignant potential. And these constitute majority of the pancreatic cystic lesions. In these patients, it's really important to not undergo surgery and to avoid any expensive anxiety-inducing long-term imaging follow-up. The surgery 
by avoiding uh, a major pancreatic surgery, unnecessary surgery, you avoid the mortality and morbidity associated with that. So how do we do that? We look into a lot of different things to identify and uh, put them into one of these three broad categories. That would be the essence of you know, this talk today. Pancreatic cystic lesions histologically can be classified into those that have an epithelial line that are the true cystic lesions. And then the pseudo cystic lesions, which means they do not have an epithelial lining to them. These are again subdivided into neoplastic and non-neoplastic categories. Just to simplify it, because there are so many you know, entities here, we broadly have non-neoplastic cystic lesions like pseudosis. And then we have neoplastic cystic lesions, which can be on the benign spectrum, such as serous cystadenoma, or those that are pre-malignant or frankly malignant, like interductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, mucinous cystic neoplasm, and solid pseudopapillary neoplasm. And then we have a category of solid pancreatic lesions that have variable cystic component within them. And these include malignancies such as neuroendocrine tumor, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, asthma cell carcinoma. Among all these cystic lesions, the commoner ones, which include pseudocyst, the IPMN, cystic adenoma, mucinous cystic neoplasm, and solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, they account for around 80 to 90 percent of all the cystic lesions. And among these, the most common ones are the pseudocysts, which account for nearly a third of all the cystic lesions, and IPMNs, which account for nearly one fourth of all the cystic lesions. You will notice that these statistics continue to evolve as more and more imaging is utilized. These numbers will keep changing, and I guess there will be an increased incidence of these IPMNs in future. So once you have detected a cystic lesion, how do you investigate these further? We rely on a few things. The first is gender and age of the patient. There are a few cystic lesions which are predominantly seen in one gender. For example, the solid pseudopathy neoplasm and mucinous cystic neoplasm are almost exclusively seen in women. Serous cystadenoma is also fairly frequently seen in women. On the other hand, lymphoepithelial cyst is much more common in men. Looking at the age, some of these cystic lesions are staggered into different age groups. Pseudocysts do not have any age prediction. They can be seen at any age group, while IPMNs are predominantly seen in the middle-aged and elderly age group. When you look at the cystic lesions that are more common in the women, they are staggered into three different age categories. On one hand, we have solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, which is predominantly seen in women in their 20s or late teens, and this is called as a classic daughter lesion. The mucinous cystic neoplasm is typically seen in the 30 to 60 or the 40 to 60 age group, and this is called as a mother lesion. And uh, we have serous cystadenoma, which is typically seen in the elderly age group and is called as a grandmother lesion. Clinical presentation is also fairly useful in arriving at a diagnosis. The pseudocysts, which are the most common cystic lesions, are often associated with a history of acute pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis or a risk factor for the same. A lot of these uh, cystic lesions they present with abdominal pain or weight discomfort. But also, a significant number of these cystic lesions are completely asymptomatic and seen incidentally at imaging. Rarely, they can have a variety of other symptomatology. These are almost always investigated further with the aid of imaging. And there are different modalities that are very useful in uh, uh, characterizing these cystic lesions. The most commonly used imaging modality is CT scan. CT scan is really good at characterizing majority of the pancreatic cystic lesions with a diagnostic accuracy of around 60 to 80 percent. It's also helpful in identifying aggressive features like presence of thick enhancing septations, presence of uh, enhancing mural nodules or soft tissue components. And it's also really great in identifying uh, calcifications in these cystic lesions better than any other modality. And when a frank malignancy is present in these cystic lesions, CT scan is excellent in staging of the malignancy, including the regional vascular involvement. There are, of course, a few downsides to CT scan. It's not that great in characterizing small cystic lesions. It's not great at identifying the ductal features. And of course, it's associated with ionizing radiation. MR is another imaging modality that is excellent in characterization of the cystic lesions. It's equal to or better than CT at characterization of the lesions and identifying aggressive features such as internal separations and neural nodularity. It's, in fact, the best modality in identifying or detecting these pancreatic cystic lesions, and one of the best modality in identifying the ductal features, including ductal obstruction, dilation of the duct, or presence of any communication between the cystic lesions and the main pancreatic duct. Another important advantage is it doesn't have any ionizing radiation. So this is an ideal modal modality for long-term imaging follow-up of lesions that require the same. 
there are of course a few downsides to MR2. It cannot detect calcifications as well as CT does. It's sensitive to motion. So sometimes we end up having these uh, motion degraded exams that are not very useful. And the third thing is it's relatively more expensive than CT scan. Next is ultrasound. Abdominal ultrasound is excellent at uh, the characterization of internal architecture of the cystic lesions. But in patients who have a large body habitus with poor sonographic penetration or cystic lesions that are small and are predominantly in the distal body tail, they are not very well assessed with abdominal ultrasound. So we rely very heavily, almost always, on uh, endoscopic ultrasound examination to identify these cystic lesions. They, uh, the endoscopic ultrasound provides us very high resolution images with very nice characterization of the internal architecture of the cystic lesions. It can show us the separations and uh, mural nodularity better than CT scan, and in a lot of cases, also better than MR. But also another important advantage is it allows us to have tissue sampling or sampling of the fluid within the cystic lesions. That helps us in further characterization of these lesions. Again, there are a few downsides to endoscopic ultrasound too, and these include it's a relatively invasive procedure, it's operator dependent, and for larger cystic lesions, due to la rapid loss of resolution with increasing depth, they may not be very well assessed. The next is cyst fluid analysis. When imaging is not enough to determine uh, uh, the to characterize the lesion, we move on to cyst fluid analysis. There are different biomarkers that you look for in cyst fluid analysis. Uh, the first thing is cytology, but cytology is not adequate in majority of the cases. When it is adequate, it's really good in detection of malignancy. It has a very high specificity in separating mucinous from non-mucinous lesions. But since the adequacy is not that great, we often rely on several other biomarkers. Some of the more prominent ones, commoner ones, include CEA and glucose, which help us in differentiating mucinous from non-mucinous lesions. A high CEA and a low, glu low glucose is what you see in a mucinous uh, neoplasm. Amylase can practically exclude a cirrhosis when you have a low level. But however, when the amylase level is high, it's not so good at differentiating different kinds of cystic lesions and is considered generally a little unreliable. And then finally, we come to the molecular markers. These can be either DNA-based or RNA-based. The DNA-based molecular markers have especially been very useful in both uh, diagnosis of these cystic lesions. For example, IPMNs tend to harbor GNAS and the MAPK genes such as KRAS and BRAF. The serous cystadenomas tend to harbor VHL mutation. Uh, Neuronecrine tumors tend to have MEN1 mutations. In addition to diagnosis, we also look for some high-risk genes. In mucinous cystic lesions, when you have these high-risk uh, genes, uh, gene mutations such as FAT4, TP53, CDNNB1, or mutations along the mTOR pathway, they are more likely to harbor advanced neoplasia, which is either high-grade dysplasia or frank invasive carcinoma. Now let's move on to some of the common cystic lesions and look at their imaging features. I'm going to be covering these uh, six cystic lesions here. First, uh, let's go by age and start with uh, the solid pseudopathic neoplasm. This is a classic dotted lesion. So it's seen in uh, women in their 20s or late teens. The mean age is uh, late 20s. And uh, they're almost exclusively seen in women. So more than 90% 90 of them occur in women. They usually present with abdominal pain, but a significant percent of these uh, patients also are completely asymptomatic and the lesions can be detected incidentally despite their large size. This lesion, it's a malignant lesion and has metastatic potential, but the prognosis is excellent after resection with a five-year survival rate approaching 97%. Coming to the imaging features, most of these locations they, are located, they can be located anywhere in the pancreas, in the head, body, or tail. They're usually large, with a mean size of around 9 centimeters. Typically, they are mixed solid cystic. So they have both cystic and solid components, but the components can be pretty variable. You can have a predominantly cystic or a predominantly solid lesion. They often tend to have um, hemorrhagic components. So you'll see T1 hyperintense and hypointense components within them. Classically, they tend to have a thick capsule around them, which is high point on t 2 images and enhances with contrast. The internal solid components, however, show little enhancement. And when imaging features are not you know, definitive, we rely on cis fluid analysis. 
Cytology is almost always helpful in making a diagnosis, but when cytology is inadequate, we look for the CDN and B1 mutations, which can help in uh, diagnosis of uh, the SPN. Here's an example, a classic example of a 25-year-old uh, woman who had a large cystic lesion that was incidentally seen when she was being worked up for low pleasure count. You see some classic imaging findings here, including a large solid and cystic lesion that has T1 hyperintense hemorrhagic components and T1 hypointense components. The solid component shows some enhancement, but it's very minimal enhancement. And there is a thick T2 hypointense capsule that does show enhancement with contrast. Another example, now the previous one was mixed solid cystic. This is predominantly cystic. You, you see a, a septated lesion that has predominantly cystic component with a very small solid mural enhancing component. There's a thick capsule, and some of these patients tend to have calcifications. This patient had linear calcifications along the septum within the lesion. Here's another example. This is the most atypical solid pseudopapillary neoplasm that I've seen in my career. This is a completely solid lesion, an exophytic lesion in the pancreatic tail, completely solid enhancing. There is no cystic component, and this was seen in a male patient who was in his sixth decade. So you do sometimes see some atypical appearances. Next, let's move on to the mucinous cystic neoplasm. Now, this is the mother lesion. So you see this almost exclusively in women, again, more than 90%. The age group is typically 40 to 60 or 30 to 60. Most of these present incidentally. They're asymptomatic and seen on incidental imaging. Some do present with abdominal pain or a palpable mass when they are large in size. At the time of detection, around 11 to 17% of these lesions harbor malignancy but they have excellent prognosis, just like SPNs, if they, if they undergo resection, with a five-year survival rate ranging between 96 to 100%. Coming to the imaging features, these are almost exclusively located in the body and tail of pancreas. They're usually unilocular or oligocystic. The number of cystic components within the lesion tend to be less than six, and each of the cystic components are usually more than two centimeters in size. Despite presence of multiple cysts, the outer contour usually tends to be rounded without any lobulations. You may see internal septations, nodularity that may or may not enhance, and occasionally we tend to see calcifications. And when calcifications are present, they're usually along the periphery rather than the central portion, like in uh, serous cystoma. The average cyst, uh, cyst size is around 4.8 centimeters. Now these cyst, cysts, uh, when they are large in size, they're more likely to harbor a malignancy or hydrate dysplasia within them typically greater than 5.1 centimeters. When imaging is indeterminate, insufficient, then we move on to cyst fluid analysis. And the major things to look for in these patients are presence of an increased uh, cyst fluid CA level, typically greater than 192, and low glucose, less than 50 grams per deciliter. And then we look for mutations, which include, uh, like IPMN, these have KRAS mutations, but do not have the gene as mutations that is only seen in IPMNs. Here's a classic example of NCN. The lesion is located in the tail. It's unilocular. It has no uh, internal septations or mural nodularity that is discernible on CT scan. However, on endoscopic ultrasound, a single thin septation was, not, septation was noted. Now, this patient lacked any aggressive features and on surgical resection too, did not have any hybrid dysplasia or invasive carcinoma. Another um, classic appearance, this patient in her uh, mid 30s, early 30s, had this uh, oligocystic lesion in the pancreatic tail with a thin internal separation and a thin enhancing wall. There was no nodularity either to the septum or to the uh, wall. This was also a lesion with low grade dysplasia and no evidence of invasive cancer at resection. Here we had a slightly atypical lesion or a lesion with some aggressive features. The location is typical in the body. It's unilocular, outer contour is more or less rounded. We see some faint internal enhancing separations, but these findings are seen much better on the endoscopic ultrasound where you see not only the separation, but you also see some nodularity along the wall. This patient also turned, uh, turned out to have a mesonocystic neoplasm with low grade dysplasia. There was no high grade dysplasia or invasive cancer. Here we have a contrasting example. Now this is a much larger lesion, already the increased size points to a greater likelihood of high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer. This patient has faint rim calcification, 
And this is typically a mural, as in this case, in patients with MCM. But most important finding in this patient is presence of this enhancing soft tissue nodular mass along the wall of the cystic lesion. This patient on this section was found to have both high-grade dysplasia in the background and small foci of invasive carcinoma, which is something that you would expect for these morphological features. Here we have uh, an atypical uh, MCM. Not all MCMs are typical. Most of them are very typical, and we can uh, suggest the diagnosis on imaging. Rarely we run into atypical lesions like these. This patient had a multi-cystic lesion with individual cystic component being small, less than two centimeters. This is a central area that actually looks like a scar and that's enhancing with contrast. These are findings that we typically expect in serious hysteronoma, including some lobular contour to this lesion. So this is completely atypical. But based on imaging, this would be a serious hysteronoma. But there are a couple of odd things about this cystic lesion. One, the woman was in her uh, late 20s. That's an odd age for serious hysteronoma. It can happen, but it's not usual. And second thing was on uh, cystoid analysis, she was found to have high CEA around 500, which is again very unusual for serious cystoid where you expect to see very low CEA levels. So this patient went underwent resection and, and was found to have a mucinous cystic neoplasm. There are several other lesions which can also look like MCN. Here are a few examples. This is a you know very typical appearance for MCN. A lesion in the tail, it's unilocular, no lobations to the contour, and has mural calcifications. But this was actually a pseudocyst that was there for a very long time, gradually evolving. This patient had a unilocular cystic lesion in the pancreatic body, no uh, lobularity to the outer you know, margin. This turned out to be a unilocular serous cystic mama, and this woman was only in her mid-30s. Another example of a um, IPMN. This patient had a branched up IPMN. This looks like a oligocystic lesion. Each cystic component is more than two centimeters in size. There's some rim calcifications, septal calcifications. This actually turned out to be a branch of IPMN. Moving on to the next lesion, serous cystic mama. Now, this is a classic uh, grandmother kind of lesion seen in elderly women. Um, the incidence is much more in women. The ratio is around three or four is to one. Most of these patients, like nearly 80% of them, are asymptomatic. Some have symptoms, which is uh, which is something that happens when you have large serous cystic mass that can cause mass effect on adjacent structures. Coming to the imaging features, they are, location, uh, the, they are evenly located throughout the pancreas. The most classic feature is when you have the typical microcystic appearance, which is what we see in majority of these cystic lesions. It has a honeycomb appearance. That is, you see multiple small cystic lesions. So greater than six cystic lesions, and they're small measuring less than two centimeters in size. This is a very classic appearance here where you see numerous tiny cystic lesions throughout the lesion. They tend to have enhancement of these uh, septae. They can sometimes have a central enhancing scar with calcifications, seen around one third of these patients. The outer wall tends to be thin. And despite its large size, often it doesn't have any mass effect on the pancreatic duct or the bile duct, depending on its location. And when uh, imaging is usually enough to make a diagnosis of serious cystoid numa. But of course, we do run into some atypical lesions, and that's when uh, we rely on cyst fluid analysis. The more important, uh, the fi important findings that you look for in cyst fluid analysis include presence of low CEA, a low glucose, high vascular endothelial growth factor levels, and the molecular mutation seen in these patients is VHA, VHRA. Again, uh, the same example that we saw earlier: numerous tiny cystic lesions, looks like a honeycomb. This patient also has a central enhancing scar with calcifications. Another classic appearance of a serous cystic numa, this time we have a large lesion in the distal body tail, numerous cystic components, central uh, scar with calcifications. But you'll notice that there are some cystic lesions which are large and several that are small. And this is a very uh, typical appearance for serous cystic numa. When you have numerous cystic lesions, it's not uncommon to see both cystic, uh, cystic lesions that are both a combination of small and larger you know, components. Now, this was an atypical uh, serious cystic numa. This patient was undergoing uh, imaging surveillance for multiple uh, cystic lesions in the pancreatic body tail, several of which communicate with the main pancreatic duct, suggesting that these are IPMNs. So the largest cystic lesion was also assumed to be an IPMN. And because this was growing in size, the patient underwent resection, 
and it turned out to be an oligocystic cystic dermoma. And uh, almost always, a prospective diagnosis is not made based on imaging when you have oligocystic cystic dermoma. Here is another slightly atypical appearance for cystic uh, cystic dermoma. When the when cystic cystic dermoma has a microcystic appearance, when you have these numerous, really really tiny cystic foci and very intensely enhancing septa in between, it can almost look like a solid lesion. This lesion actually looks like a centrally necrotic neuroendocrine tumor with a degree of enhancing solid component in the periphery. On ultrasound 2, a lot of these serous cystadenomas look like they are solid lesions because of the closed, closed interfaces from the numerous small cystic foci. <clears throat> this actually was a serous cystadenoma. So there is something called as a solid variant of uh, serous cystadenoma. Next, let's move on to interductal papillary mucinous neoplasm. This is, of course, one of the most common uh, lesions and one of the more interesting lesions in pancreas. These are usually seen in the 50 to 70 age, age group with a slight male predominance. And like MCMs, these, are, these have a risk of malignant transformation. In these patients, the ductal epithelium um, is neoplastic and secretes a lot of thick mucin, resulting in dilation of the ductal component that is involved by this lesion. Now you can either have involvement of the main pancreatic duct or the branch ducts or both. Whichever is involved tends to be dilated. And accordingly, these are named as branch duct IPMN, main duct IPMN, or the mixed duct IPMN. The branch duct IPMN tends to have these side branch. These are either unilocular or uh, multicystic with a, branch, with a bunch of grapes-like appearance, or they can be tubular. They can be, uh, they communicate with the main uh, duct without causing dilation of the main pancreatic duct. They can be uh, single or we may see multiple of these. It can be a multifocal branch duct IPMN. When you have a uh, lack of any aggressive features, they tend to be uh, not associated with advanced neoplasia such as high grade uh, dysplasia or carcinoma. Occasionally, they, they can have calcifications. Some studies talk about how presence of calcifications uh, increases the likelihood of presence of advanced neoplasia. These tend to be uh, relatively homogeneously T2 hyperintense and T1 hypointense. Main duct IPMNs uh, result, uh, you have the neoplastic epithelium lining the main duct and secretion of the mucin is within the main duct. So you have dilation of the main duct. And this can either be segmental involving only a part of the main pancreatic duct or it can be diffuse involving the entire main pancreatic duct. When the ductal involvement is present at the level of the ampulla, endoscopic appearance is pretty interesting. You tend to see a fish mouth like appearance with a gaping major papilla with mucin extruding into the duodenal lumen. On endoscopic ultrasound, you often tend to see some degree of nodularity along the ductal epithelium. And then you have the mixed type IPMNs where you have a cystic lesion which involves the branch duct with contiguous dilation of the main pancreatic duct. And that is the mixed uh, with components of both main duct and branch duct. Now, with IPMN, in addition to identifying the lesion, we want to look for these aggressive features, features that help you in identifying advanced neoplasia, or, uh, you know, in other words, this is high-grade dysplasia or invasive cancer is what you're looking for. So you're looking for thick nodular septations, a thick enhancing wall, or more importantly, enhancing mural nodules, as you see in this patient. This patient had a branch duct IPMN involving the uncinate process, with enhancing solid components within that you can see both on CT scan and on the specimen. But more importantly, this patient had an associated hypoenhancing invasive carcinoma in the pancreatic head that was causing the biliary obstruction re requiring this metallic stent placement. Same thing that you see on the path specimen too. So we are always look looking out for these things. Uh, one more thing that we have to keep in mind is that IPMNs cause a field defect in the ductal epithelium. So when you have an IPMN, irrespective of how many you have, where you have, the entire pancreatic ductal epithelium is at risk for developing a malignancy. So in these patients, it's not uncommon to see either synchronous or metachronous pancreatic malignancies and to find malignancy away from the IPMN that you're you know, actually surveying. Almost always make, we make a diagnosis of IPMN, especially the main duct IPMN uh, based on imaging. Occasionally, we run into uh, some problems and we are not completely sure based on imaging. And again, we fall back on the cystoid analysis. And the major things to look for include 
a high CA level greater than 192, a low glucose level less than 50, and the molecular markers. Like uh, MCN, you tend to see KRAS mutations, but GNAS mutations and other MAPK mutations such as BRAF are only seen in IPMN and not in MCN. And we are always looking for the high risk mutations such as E53, SMAD4, and the mutations around the mTOR pathway, which indicate presence of advanced neoplasia. Again, when you say advanced neoplasia, this is either high grade dysplasia or invasive carcinoma. We look at a few examples of branch shift IPMNs. This is the same example that we saw earlier, a solitary branch shift IPMN, the CS cystic region in the ANSNED, which communicates with the main pancreatic duct. There is some internal complex related to this. There are several separations. Some of the separations had nodularity, which on administration of contrast did show enhancement. So now you have some septal nodularity, and that is an aggressive feature. And that's why this patient underwent a Whipple procedure, but was fortunately found not to have an invasive cancer. Uh, another example of a main duct type human. This patient has a segmental involvement of the main duct. In the region of the body of pancreas, we see this dilated main pancreatic duct. The patient was undergoing serial surveillance imaging and two years later was found to have a faintly visualized but a fairly large enhancing mildly enhancing solid component this is an unenhanced ct image that shows that it's slightly higher than the background water attenuation and post contrast we see a little bit of enhancement this turned out to be a colloid carcinoma arising within the main duct ipmn another example of a patient with main duct ipmn once again you see marked dilation of the main duct once the main duct IPMN exceeds the size of one centimeter, the likelihood of underlying high grade dysplasia or malignancy goes way higher. Some studies quote up to 40% incidence of malignancy in these patients. So, this patient had a lot of uh, not only the marked dilation, but several enhancing soft tissue components, nicely seen on the endoscopic ultrasound, too. Mm -hmm. This patient turned out to have in, uh, main duct IPMN with a small foci of invasive adenocarcinoma. Here's another interesting. Um, patient with an interesting IPM, main duct IPMN. There is diffuse dilation of the entire main pancreatic duct. You do see some filling defects within the main duct, and these filling defects were enhancing on contrast with CT scan. So this patient had um, a main duct with these aggressive features. But an, another uh, interesting feature is this patient actually had a fistulous communication to the luminous stomach. And a presentation also had these and uh, hypo-enhancing metastasis in the liver. When you have uh, fistless communication from the main duct, IPMN, either to the bile duct or adjacent structure such as stomach, there's a very high likelihood of underlying malignancy. Uh, let's look at a couple of examples of this field effect. So what I mean by field effect is you have an IPMN in one location, but you develop cancer in another location. That's because the entire pancreatic duct, ductal epithelium, is at risk for developing malignancy. This patient in his uh, late 70s or uh, early 80s had uh, this segmental dilation of the main pancreatic duct that on serial imaging was progressively increasing in size. Five years later, this guy was getting annual surveillance imaging. In his fifth year, there was not only increase in size of the main duct IPMN, but he had a new malignancy in the pancreatic neck away from his IPMN, which was predominantly in the distal body tail. He also had uh, hypo-enhancing metastasis at the time of uh, his initial detection of malignancy. Another similar example. Now, this is the same patient that we have seen earlier with a mixed IPMN. We see multifocal branch duct IPMNs and involvement of the main duct in the pancreatic head. If you look co closely at the pancreatic tail, the pancreatic duct is actually normal in caliber, smooth in contour. It's not involved by IPMN. There are no branch duct IPMNs either. This patient underwent people procedure, did not have any high-grade dysplasia or uh, cancer. But on serial imaging later on, nearly four years later, his pancreatic tail, which was initially normal, except for the bipedal appearance, he developed a pancreatic cancer within the tail. So there was no IPM in here, but because of the field effect, he was prone for malignancy and did develop malignancy in the pancreatic tail. Next, let's move on to uh, cystic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, these are very rare. The neuroendocrine tumor by themselves are rare, and uh, cystic, neuro cystic neuroendocrine tumors are even rarer. They're often asymptomatic and instantly seen. Rarely, they can uh, present with symptoms if they have a functioning component within them, like an insulinoma or glucagonoma. Most of these are sporadic, but are seen more often in patients who have uh, MEN1 syndrome. 
they constitute around one third of all the uh, cystic all the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors these on imaging tend to be either unilocular or oligocystic you can see like a solid mass with some small cystic components or it can be predominantly cystic the wall tends to be thick tends to enhance, it tends to hyper enhance, and you may see some nodularity or irregularity. <clears throat> and infrequently, you may even see calcifications in these cystic neuroendocrine tumors. They're usually unifocal, but can be occasionally multifocal, especially in patients who have man man syndrome. On uh, cyst fluid analysis, the major thing that we look out for is presence of men one mutations to diagnose these. Here we have a couple of examples. The first is a predominantly cystic uh, neuroendocrine tumor. On MR, you can see that it has a lot of uh, complex to it. We have a T2 hyperintense cystic component and a lot of debris that you can see both on endoscopic ultrasound and MR that does not enhance with contrast. So it's all mostly non-enhancing cystic components and debris. The enhancing component is only the wall of the cystic region. It's a hyper-enhancing, slightly thick wall with a little bit of irregularity to the wall predominantly along the inner aspect. So this is a typical cystic neuroendocrine tumor. Another patient with more or less similar findings, predominantly cystic, really small pancreatic cystic lesion with a hyper-enhancing, slightly irregular, slightly thick wall. In this case, the diagnosis was clinched based on a duratate PET uh, scan that shows a lot of aggravity within this cystic lesion. Another cystic lesion, this was a mid-20s young woman who presented with this lesion. Uh, this actually was seen incidentally when she was being worked up for trauma. So you see a large solid cystic lesion and in, uh, in this patient a preoperative diagnosis of uh, solid pseudopapillary tumor was considered however this turned out to be a cystic neuroendocrine tumor now retrospectively we can see a couple of things are you know not really you know um, what you would expect in uh, a solid pseudopapillary tumor one is we don't have any hemorrhagic t1 hyperintense components but the more important finding is that the solid component has intense enhancement while most of the patients with SPM tend to have minimal enhancement of the solid component. Finally, let's move on to pseudocyst, or you know, in general, in general, the pancreatitis related collections. I think this is best addressed in a talk where you have uh, a dedicated talk on pancreatitis. So I'm going to briefly skim through this uh, entity. Pseudocyst can be seen at any age group. It can have any kind of morphological appearance. It can have uh, any kind of size, and you can see it anywhere in the pancreas. Um, often, these patients tend to have a history of acute or chronic pancreatitis, or you find evidence for the same on imaging. Often, you tend to see a appropriate etiology for pancreatitis. It could be alcohol, smoking, or other entities, some of which are anatomical you know, etiology. The collections are of four different types, acute peripancreatic fluid collection, which goes on, matures, and becomes a pseudocyst or you have acute necrotic collection, which matures into a wall of necrotic collection. So like I said, the morphological appearance is very variable. It can be large, it can be small. You may have calcifications. You may not have mural calcifications. It may be completely cystic, or you may have varying degrees of internal debris within them. But what you don't see in a pseudocyst or any pancreatitis related collection is presence of any significant enhancing soft tissue components within the lesion. You may have a thick wall. You may have a little bit of irregularity, but you don't really see any discrete mural nod enhancing mural nodules in these patients. Um, there are a lot of other pancreatic cystic lesions, but they are very uncommon. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these other cystic lesions. Uh, but there are a lot of these really interesting cystic lesions uh, that can be seen in pancreas. Finally, let's uh, look at the management guidelines for pancreatic cystic lesions. Let's look at a couple of examples first. Here we have an example of a, uh, a patient. Uh, she's a nearly 60 year old woman. She was incidentally found to have a small cystic lesion in the pancreatic unfinished process when she was getting worked up for uh, abdominal pain. And uh, she did not undergo any further surveillance imaging later, but seven years later was found to have a hypoenhancing mass in the head of pancreas, which turned out to be pancreatic cancer. And unfortunately, this patient died five months after the diagnosis. Another patient. Now, this is the same patient that we have seen earlier with regards to the field defect, the IPMN. The patient has a segmental main duct IPMN involving the pancreatic tail that gradually progressed over five years. Now, this patient was diligent in obtaining surveillance imaging. He would get annual surveillance imaging 
mostly with CT, sometimes with endoscopic ultrasound. But the first time a malignancy was detected in this patient, he not only had this new malignancy in the pancreatic neck, but also had metastasis to the liver at the time of the initial detection, and unfortunately died within 11 months of uh, the diagnosis. Now, you know, he did have a dilated duct, which increases the likelihood of malignancy and could have undergone a surgery earlier, but he did not undergo because of his comorbidities, which included, included a lot of things, including hypertension and heart failure. A third example is of a young woman, nearly for early 40s. Uh, she was found to have an incidental main duct IPMN involving the body tail. This uh, IPMN was greater than one centimeter in caliber. So she needed one and did get a distal pancreatectomy. And, uh, you know, she does not have to undergo a lot of follow-up imaging. And uh, we didn't have to wait she, till she developed the malignancy or had metastasis. So it was probably the right thing to excise this lesion. At surgery, at search path, she did not have any malignancy or high-grade dysplasia. But despite that, it was probably the right decision to resect her pancreas, given her young age. So we have this uh, problem on one hand, where we see these tiny cystic lesions or larger you know, cystic lesions that can and sometimes will transform into a malignancy. And as you know, pancreatic cancer has a very dismal prognosis, and it's almost like a death sentence. That's about individual patients. But when you look at the population, you know, at the population level, it's a completely different story. Pancreatic cysts are very common. These small cystic lesions on population studies tend to have a very low risk overall for developing pancreatic cancer. According to this recent publication in uh, European Radiology from this year, the risk of pancreatic malignancy in patients who have small cysts ranging between five and five millimeters and two centimeters is really, really low, similar to those without any pancreatic cysts. So how do you balance between these two? In some, where you don't need any follow-up, it's unnecessary expense, unnecessary surgery, unnecessary anxiety. And on the other hand, you know that some of these patients develop malignancy and can eventually die from that, and you want to avoid that. Frankly, we don't have a great handle on how to do this. We have a lot of uh, guidelines from different societies and different uh, you know, consensus groups. Just the very fact that you have so many different guidelines uh, tells you that we don't have a great handle. The experts also understand that they don't have a great handle, but people are working towards trying to come up with some, something that is more meaningful, that's more useful in trying to segregate one from the other. Uh, my advice is stick to one, uh, one of these guidelines that most people in your institution follow. For example, in my institution, most of us follow the revised FUCOPA guidelines, which I think is also the most commonly um, followed uh, guidelines across the world. <clears throat> According to this, we uh, should be looking for on imaging a few things. Look for high risk stigmata or presence of any worrisome features. If neither of these are present, then the patient might need surveillance and uh, the duration of surveillance, the period between different uh, imaging exams varies based on the patient's uh, cystic lesion and the morphology. When you have high risk stigmata, which is either you have obstructive jaundice, which would translate into obstructive biliary uh, uh, dilation, or presence of an enhancing neural nodule that's more than five, five millimeters, or main duct dilation exceeding 10 millimeters. These patients are advised surgery if they are fit and able to go undergo surgery. Now, those patients who have worrisome features, which include size of the cyst greater than three centimeters, enhancing neural nodule that's less than five millimeters, thick or enhancing walls, a main duct that is dilated but less than 10 millimeters, any abrupt change in the pancreatic duct caliber, or a relatively rapid cyst growth rate of greater than five millimeters per two years. Our presence of any regional lymph nodes, elevated CA99. These are the patients who are advised to undergo further assessment with endoscopic ultrasound. And based on what we see on endoscopic ultrasound and associated cytology, they're either advised uh, long-term surveillance or they're advised surgery if they have some of these more high-risk features. So this is in uh, short the revised FUCOFA guidelines. You have to understand that this is uh, mainly tailored for uh, the IPMNs, not for the other cystic lesions. In conclusion, pancreatic cystic lesions are very common. The imaging features and demographics often help us in arriving at a diagnosis. But for those lesions that are imaging indeterminate, we uh, rely on cyst fluid analysis. The fluid biomarkers, especially the molecular genetics, are very helpful in diagnosing the cystic lesions and identifying presence of any advanced neoplasia.
There are multiple different guidelines that exist for management of pancreatic cystic lesions. Choose one that works best for you and stick to it. And make sure that you keep updated with the current guidelines because these are going to keep on evolving and keep on changing. I would like to acknowledge the help that I received uh, from Dr. Harkir Singh and Dr. Rohit Das from my institution. Both of them gave, provided me some images. I also uh, used some images from online websites, including freebook.com and amflash.com. These are my references. And uh, this is the beautiful city of uh, Pittsburgh where I live and work. Thank you all for uh, spending your time with me this, today. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Anil. That was a wonderful talk. Um, there are some questions that we can go through. Uh, one, of, one of the questions uh, is a little bit vague. It asks, Actually, Biata, you're you waiting. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question again? The question is the CT MR, which is uh, it's a very that's sad. Again, your voice is breaking a little bit, but I think I heard CT and MR, which is the better imaging modality. Uh, if that's a question, uh, is the image. if uh, the question was CT or MR, which is better for evaluating the pancreatic cystic lesions, uh, I'm going to say there's no clear favorite. Uh, both are uh, very good at characterization of this le these lesions. We talked about how they have their own um, positives and negatives. Overall, I'm going to say MR is better, slightly better than CT. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, including the ductal morphology, the soft tissue resolution, lack of ionizing radiation. Um, I'm going to say MR is slightly better than CT, but relatively same. It also depends on you know your institutional preference, your uh, familiarity with the modality. Thank you, Neil. Uh, there is a question. That's for lesion or again, uh, Beata, I'm sorry, your voice is breaking, but I'm looking at the uh, QA. I see a question here where uh, you know they ask uh, about how MRI is not always practical in countries with fewer resources. Is endoscopic ultrasound preferred to diagnose cystic lesions, or would that be too invasive? Uh, I, I don't think endoscopic ultrasound is too invasive. It's a relatively invasive procedure, uh, but uh, when you don't have MR, <clears throat> even when you have an MR, I think endoscopic ultrasound can be very useful. It's both to obtain you know, a better sense of the internal architecture of the cystic region and also obtain tissue sampling. Either you get the cytology from the solid component or the cyst fluid analysis. For example, the glucose level estimation is very quick, very easy. You need a very tiny amount of the cyst fluid to assess the glucose content. And it can show you the difference between a mucinous and a non-mucinous cystic region. When we talk about you know, mucinous versus non-mucinous, it's really important because most of the non-mucinous cystic lesions do not progress to malignancy, while the mucinous cystic lesions are the ones that can progress to malignancy and may require or may require you know, long-term follow-up. I see here's another question, uh, role of PET-CT in pancreatic cysts. I'm going to say it's very minimal uh, unless you have a strong suspicion that there is an underlying malignancy, uh, PET CT may not be very helpful, at least to my knowledge. The dotated PET, on the other hand, can be helpful in the cystic neuroendocrine tumors, as you have seen one of uh, you know my images where we see a small uh, cystic, predominantly cystic lesion with a hyper-enhancing, slightly thick wall that was you know intensely dotated away. 
I think that's all for the question. Um, so thank you, Dr. Dasyam. It was very good oh. to have you with us. Um, and we're very grateful that you took the time out of your schedule to give us a very informative session on cystic pancreatic lesions. And I think that concludes our grand rounds for this week. Thank you. Thank you again. I'd like to once again thanks, uh, thank uh, Helper, the World Academy, and a very big thank you to all those who attended the talk today. Thank you so much, Piara, for moderating the session. Sorry, my cut out for the person there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone else. And clearly, I hope that this trainee is very American. Thank you.